So, what if I told you that right now there's a football player called Kazuya Shimura who's still actively playing the Portuguese second tier despite the fact he made his debut in 1986? For some perspective, Cantonao made his debut around the same time as Miura, already retired 26 years ago. The guy is so old that he was literally in the first ever FIFA game to be released. But focusing on his age goes completely against the point of this video. Everyone seems to love to constantly mention his age, but in my opinion, that is almost tainting his legacy. Reducing Kazumiura to just another trivia question goes completely against everything he fought for. His age shouldn't matter, it isn't his age that makes him special, in fact, the only reason he's been allowed to play for this long is because of how special he already was, he would have gone to any lengths to fulfill his dream of playing football, whether that meant moving across the globe as a child or coming back and jump-starting a football revolution. His story is so incredible that there's even a common misconception that he was the inspiration behind Captain Tsubasa. And though that isn't true, they did make his life into an anime, it just wasn't that one. Look, imagine being in his position. The guy grows up in one of the few cities in Japan that has the slightest interest in football and for some reason he just becomes completely obsessed with it, despite everyone around him being too busy with baseball. He grows up feeling like a complete alien in his own country. Even when he looks back, there's only one player who ever managed to leave the country and find his place in Europe. It was pretty much hopeless. He either accepted he'd never have an actual career or he'd risk everything and move away. And that's what makes Miura so special. He didn't even hesitate. Only one year after joining a school, only because it supposedly had the most prestigious academy in the country, he realized things weren't moving forward. So despite being only 15 years old, he saved up $700, put all of his things in a bag and moved to Brazil without knowing a word of Portuguese. And still, somehow quickly managed to get himself some trials and before he knew it, he had joined his first club, Juventus SP. And look, I'm not gonna lie to you, it was rough. He struggled to adapt his game, he struggled with the language, he even had a hard time making friends. At 17, he literally almost quit everything and moved back to Japan, but instead, he stuck with it, put his head into the game and two years later, after leading his team to the under-21 state championship, Santos signed him and suddenly, he was the talk of the town. They called him the Japanese Garrincha, the Samurai, even Dunga praised his performance on his debut. Regardless, he was young, it was hard for him to be seen as anything more than the Asian guy. Whenever he played poorly, he was criticized twice as harshly and so he quickly got stuck in a cycle, moving from club to club until he arrived at King's Zhao in the third tier where things finally started working out for him. Taking center stage as the team managed to beat Corinthians, impressing everyone at the Paulista, being named the third best winger in the competition and earning a transfer to Curitiba, finally getting another chance at the top flight, quickly establishing himself as a key player and leading Santos to come back for his signing with their tails between their legs. After all, by then there were European clubs making the rounds with an unnamed Italian side even offering half a million for his signing, which back then was a gigantic deal. For comparison, Paolo Di Canio moved to Lazio that same year for around the same amount. However, it never seemed like Miura was happy once he was back there. Things never went as well as he hoped for, he got tired of being the Japanese guy and honestly, he began questioning all of his life decisions, but then something hit him. He had spent his life looking for football somewhere else, but what if he could bring football back to Japan? What if instead of looking for his place in the football world, he created one of his own? And Thankfully for him, the timing was perfect. With Zico having just shocked the world by joining Kashima Handlers, everyone's interest for Japanese football had peaked. Big companies began investing in the teams and once Kawasaki took control of Tokyo Verdi, they looked at him and decided he was going to be their star signing because, after all, Miura was infinitely marketable. He was like a hero out of a fairy tale for them. Coming back to his home after a mysterious stint on the other side of the globe, brushing shoulders with world-class players, even a bit of samba when he scored his goals and the crowd went nuts, especially because, well, he scored so many and played so incredibly well that two years later, Verdi had already won the league twice. And of course, with Kazumiura becoming a household name, he also got called up to his first international tournament, the 1992 Asian Cup, where things couldn't have gone any better for him.
After a poor start, Japan found themselves needing a win in the final match of the group stage and who showed up with a miraculous goal? Miura. In the semis they go behind in the first minute versus their rivals China and who inspires the team to a massive comeback? Miura. And after one more win, they were champions for the first time in their history and with Miura taking the player of the tournament award, the Asian player of the year award and earning the nickname King Kazu, all while the J-League replaced old JSL with massive investments coming to the game, Miura went from household name to literal superstar status. And as more and more legends arrived at the league from Lineker to Litbarski, Kazu was always there outscoring everyone, taking the titles and MVP awards. If once Kazu had lost hope in Japan and gone looking somewhere else, now Japan had lost hope in itself and as they looked for foreigners to bring some talent to the country, Miura showed them that the talent had been there all along, that they could do it themselves if they wanted it bad enough. Enough. He was the hero of the people. And don't let the emotional side of this overshadow how good he was. He was getting all of these awards because he deserved them. In that first J League season, he pretty much carried his team on his back to the title. Over the last six months of the season, they played 19 matches and won every game except one, with Miura scoring 17 goals in that same period, even scoring twice against Zico's team, the Kashima Handlers, in the final, and scoring the winning goal in the Afro Asian Cup final against the Ivory Coast on extra time. By the end of the year, he had made such an impact in the world of football that he was even invited by AC Milan to play against them in a charity match in what was supposed to be a team composed of the best players in the world. And of course, he made sure to assist Hugo Sanchez in that match, impressing everyone enough that AC Milan ended up asking him to stay over for a trial, though nothing ever materialized. And if that was already a bit unfortunate, the next year, with Kazu completely dominating the World Cup qualification stage with 13 goals in 13 matches, he was hit with the most heartbreaking moment of his career. With one game to go, Japan was top of their group but still in a delicate position where only a win over Iran would allow them to keep their spot in the World Cup. As the game started, Kazu was quick to put them in front but then Iran tied the score and finally, with the last play of the match, they scored to kill the Japanese dream. The match became known as the Agony of Doha. With another chance at earning his place at the world stage falling through, those feelings from earlier in his career began coming back to him as he began to feel that, as he was closing in on his 30s, he would soon be seen as spoiled goods, and so he finally fell into the temptation of moving to Europe, becoming the first ever Asian in Serie A, joining Genoa. Once again, the usual complaints arrive. On his presentation day, one of the journalists literally had the nerve to ask him if he thought his own signing had only happened as a way to get Kenwood, a Japanese company, to sponsor Genoa's jerseys. Kazu had everything to prove them wrong, but unfortunately, that move became notorious for an incredible streak of bad luck. On his first match, he smashed into an advertising board and literally broke his nose and his eye socket, being left out for a month. Then, as he came back, he was was called up for international duty and missed a bunch of games, then the club kept changing managers and eventually he left the team with only one goal. And even though Torino and Sporting tried to sign him, he just went back to Verdi, honestly, kind of traumatized. Still, once back there, he was as good as ever, taking them to the final once again while also being the league's top scorer and making it to the team of the season. However, following an injury-riddled season in 1997, with Kazu now into his 30s, some began worrying he would not be able to match up to his performances of previous years, especially with the World Cup qualification stage coming soon after. But instead, that's when he came back in full force with 14 goals in 12 matches, including 6 in a single match against Macau, the all-time record for a Japanese player, securing their qualification to the greatest tournament on earth. Kazu was quite literally on top of the world, he was just a step away from making his dreams a reality, but I'm sorry to tell you that once again they broke his heart, as the national team coach shocked the country by quite simply deciding not to call him up. Instead, doing the most ironic thing possible and calling up Wagner Lopes in his place, a Brazilian player who had moved to Japan at 18 after failing to find his place in his home country. Meaning, pretty much, the anti-Kazu. As you might imagine, this really upset him, especially as without him, the Japanese national team ended up embarrassing themselves, losing every single match at the World Cup. But still, once they asked him, is there something you want to say to Mr. Okada, who was the national team coach, he replied, no, 
Nothing, which ironically said a lot considering it would be years before he joined the national team again. With all of this sending him into another identity crisis, this time leading him to a lone move to Dynamo Zagreb in Croatia, guess what happened there? He was once again labeled as nothing but a marketing stunt. And though his time was impactful enough that Jean-Pierre Papa even called him up to his ceremonial match, he ended up moving back regardless despite having offers from England and Scotland. Back in Japan, he joined Kyoto Sango, where he actually played alongside the iconic Jisung Park, even finishing the year in the top scorer's podium despite being already 33, which did earn him his return to the Japanese national team, though it would serve no purpose as he chose to retire from international football just two games later as the country's second highest goal scorer of all time. But hey, don't think things got boring from there on out, the guy still managed to find a way to somehow play in a World Cup, you'll see what I mean. Regardless, after four seasons at Vissel Kobe, he joined Yokohama FC in the Japanese second tier, which might seem kind of lame until he realized that Kazu immediately brought them up to the top flight, quickly becoming an absolute fan favorite at the club. In fact, once the season was over, he even managed to become the first ever player to be given the status of guest player at the Australian A-League, which allowed him to play four matches for Sydney FC. Fun fact, he was actually picked on the recommendation of Litbarski, the German legend and then manager of Sydney FC, who had played in Japan back in Kazu's prime, becoming a big fan of the king himself. And thankfully for both, things went really well actually. It was, you know, uh, short but sweet, with 38-year-old Kazu lining up alongside Dwight York and still pulling off an incredible performance against league leaders Adelaide FC, scoring twice and then becoming the first ever Japanese player to take part in the Club World Cup. Regardless, after five more seasons at Yokohama, constantly helping the club in their battles against relegation, he even got an offer to join Kings Jaú, one of the first teams he ever represented back in Brazil. However, as fun as that sounded, he ended up rejecting it, instead staying at Yokohama, where over time his role became less and less significant, one year later even joining their futsal team as well, somehow turning enough heads that it earned him a place in the Japanese futsal national team, then literally getting called up to the Futsal World Cup. Sure, it is not even close to the real thing, but I really hope that in some way it helped, you know, to ease his pain somehow. Regardless, after some injury problems over the next two years, Kazu still managed to complete 21 games in a season in 2016 at 49 years of age, but after surpassing the first ever Ballon d'Or winner Stanley Matthews to become the oldest ever player to feature and score in a professional match, Kazu finally began to take a few steps back, taking on the role of a sort of locker room figure and mentor for his teammates, playing only 26 matches over the following four years before absurdly joining the Suzuka Point Gatherers in the Japanese 4th Division on loan as a sort of favor to his brother Yasutoshi Miura, who had actually lined up alongside him at Verdi and Kobe and was now the team's director. As a result, he completely annihilated the team's attendance record of 1,300 spectators, with nearly 5,000 fans flooding the stadium hoping to see him. At that point, it seemed things were more than over, but that's exactly when King Kazu shocked me more than ever by moving to my own country, joining Portuguese club Oliveirense. If that sounds too strange to be real, well, Yokohama and Oliveirense are actually owned by the same company, so, you know, it was easier than it looks. Regardless, please think twice before calling his career a marketing stunt. Once, someone criticized him saying he was just a side attraction, like a panda in a zoo, so Kazu Kazu replied, I'm proud of that role. It's okay if I'm just a panda being used to draw in the crowds. If the fans won't come for the regular bear, let them come for the panda. Because in the end, what matters is that they come. That was the secret to all of this. After bringing in the fans through his skills and helping build a foundation of what is Japanese football, even with his skills dwindling, Kazu found a way to give more to the sport, to bring more people in, and whether or not it was a novelty at first, then the ones who stayed were truly hooked. And personally, I think that's beautiful.